All right. Thank you for joining me today. I've called this program Dealing with the Problem of Evil. I chose the word dealing because it's an intellectual problem, but it's also a practical problem. So I thought that word kind of captured both aspects, and we'll be talking about both today. But let's start by stating the problem of evil. Maybe you have a good idea what I mean by that, but it's good to precisely define your terms. So we'll start our first of many statements of the problem of evil. We'll start with the classic definition attributed to Epicurus, a Greek philosopher of the third century BC. If God is willing to take away evil and is unable to do so, then he is feeble. If he's able and willing, he is malevolent. So willing to, able to take away evil and unwilling to do so. If he is both willing and able, which alone is suitable to God, from what source then are the evils or why does he remove them? So first question, is there a problem of evil? So I was talking with Mary, who I work with often, who is known for very long presentations. And before, a couple weeks ago, how in the world are you ever gonna condense down your material to 45 minutes or whatever exact amount you have? And she's like, you know, it'd be really difficult. I had to script everything out, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I have the problem of evil. That's gonna be really hard to cover in 45 minutes too. And she said, no, 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 that's really easy. I can cover that in two minutes. And in a way she's right. The, the intellectual problem of evil is not necessarily that difficult. Uh, a lot of people have called it the greatest challenge to Christianity. I don't find it very challenging intellectual, and you'll see why in a minute here. However, practically speaking, it, it is the greatest challenge to Christianity. When people leave the church, they might give a wide variety of reasons. When you talk to someone who's an ex-Christian, they might sign all kinds of things, you know, biblical contradictions or something like that. That's never the real reason, or at least almost never is the real reason. In my experience, it almost always boils down to some form of the problem of evil. It could be a personal situation, an abusive parent who claimed to be a Christian, or a, a pastor who was abusive, or it could be, I saw hypocrisy in the church, people were saying one thing, doing another, didn't make any sense. Or it could be, Something happened to someone I know, right? This person seemed to be a very good Christian. They seemed to be very faithful to God, and they encountered a horrific situation in their life. Or, you know, a loved one died. I asked God to heal them from the sickness, and it didn't happen. Something along those lines. So practically speaking, the problem of evil is a very serious challenge to Christianity. And we're created as beings who are intellectual. We're challenged to use our minds. But that's not the primary way that we interact with our daily lives. Primarily, we act socially, emotionally. And thus, the problem becomes quite serious. We're created in this way, and this is a problem that affects our emotions. Absolutely. So that leads me to our, my first key point here. And that's, yes, this is a very real problem. But it's a problem that everyone faces. It's often posed as this kind of super proof against Christianity. But the thing is, it isn't just Christians who have to deal with the problem of evil. Everyone has to deal with the problem of evil. We all look at the world and we feel like it's wrong. We feel like there's something not right about this world. And thus we must provide an explanation for it. Where does this come from? This evil, if you like, where does this evil come from? Why does it persist? Or maybe it's not real at all. So we'll look at a couple answers to this. Start with atheism, since it's supposedly the grand proof of atheism. Modern atheists typically don't offer a lot of reasons for atheism. They like to play games and say, we don't believe anything, we don't have to prove anything. But when an explanation is offered, it's usually some sort of phrasing of the problem of evil. And by atheism, I'm Referring primarily to naturalism, obviously any individual atheist might have any variety of ideas, but when you think about atheism intellectually, you usually come down to naturalism. That is that everything in the world is material. There are particles, laws of nature, chemical reactions, 
so forth. But everything boils down to just those particles, laws of nature, initial state, random chance. So the atheist has two options within their worldview, right? That doesn't mean an, an, an individual atheist thinks this way. I, I always have to get this disclaimer because when you talk about Christianity or something, people understand that individual Christians might not think that. But when you talk about atheism, suddenly it becomes, oh, I, I'm an atheist and I'm moral, therefore atheism can be moral or something along those lines. So I'm talking about the belief system, not individuals. So the main option classically in atheist thought is to say that evil doesn't actually exist. There's only things that we like and there's things that we don't like, but there's no absolutes. Maybe a society has relative, they have moral principles that they've established by consensus. You're supposed to follow those, but they're arbitrary. They're decisions based on a group of people who likes certain things and establish those things as societal norms, as morals. There is no absolute, so there is no true good or true evil. Now, most people don't really like this, right? Most atheists don't really like this idea. They might give lip service to it, but they don't really live their lives that way. They feel like that person who did something that they don't like is evil, who's done something horrific. And when you look at atheist arguments today against Christianity or against religion, they call it all religion, but they really mean Christianity. They'll say things like, your picture of God is immoral. You, your God is a monster or something like that. It's like, hold on, your system doesn't allow you to say that. So what's become popular in atheism, at least on a popular level, right, individuals, is to say that, yeah, moral laws exist, but they're just like natural laws. They're just something that's out there. It's part of of reality and our job is to discover it. However, this is highly problematic because moral laws don't work anything like natural laws. Can't draw an analogy on a natural law to prove that there could be a pre-existent moral law because natural laws, you can't violate a natural law. Natural laws apply to all of creation, right? All of the world, all the universe. Moral laws plausibly only refer to human beings. No one says that an animal is immoral when it kills another animal, for, that, for example. We don't call a lion a murderer when it kills a gazelle. So intellectually, atheism doesn't really have any good answer. They have a weak answer in saying, ah, it doesn't exist. But you can't really say, okay, you can't say prove, right? You can't prove that, but it doesn't fit with your intuition. It doesn't fit with your expectations. And practically speaking, doesn't offer anything, right? It doesn't offer any sort of solution to the problem. And so I, many different worldviews have many different ideas. I'm not gonna go through them all, but I do wanna touch on one real quick because it shows how poor this is as an argument for atheism, because there's one belief system that has the easiest, most simplistic answer intellectually, which is classic polytheism. Uh, in, in polytheism, typically, there's many gods, right? And they're basically human beings with superpowers. They have the same defects, if you like, as human beings. They can be jealous, they can be angry, they can be arbitrary. And thus, suffering is the result of either angering a god and causing them to intentionally harm you, or some arbitrary decision. The, the deity decided, ah, today it'd be fun to torture that guy, so I'm going to do it. So intellectually, polytheism offers a very, very easy answer to the problem of evil. So if someone's going to say, well, you know, I'm not a Christian because you don't have a good answer to the problem of evil, then I'd say, well, I guess you should be a polytheist because they have the easiest answer. However, practically speaking, it doesn't offer much of a solution. It puts the blame on the individual who is suffering, saying, uh, it's probably your fault, right? You probably angered some god. And it doesn't offer a great solution. Yeah, you could try to appease that God, but you don't know which God you've angered. You don't know what you've done. You can try to offer a sacrifice, but maybe they just had a bad day, right? They're not perfect. They're arbitrary. They get caused harm in your life for something you have no control over. Whoops. I don't know how I went like 10 slides there once. All right. So 
without going through all the options, let's just summarize what the possibilities are. So evil could be caused by an external force, uh, you know, a powerful being, a, a, go a god, if you like, a demon, whatever. Uh, it could be the result of one's own actions, either something you've done in this life, or if you believe in reincarnation, something you did in a previous life, but ultimately your own fault. Or evil is caused by a misunderstanding of the world. It's caused by your own thoughts. You perceive evil, but it doesn't actually exist. Your job is tr to correct your thoughts to not experience evil anymore. Or it doesn't exist at all, right? Uh, there's only things we like and things we dislike. We've just invented this term evil arbitrarily. Or it has a purpose that leads to a higher good. So let's formally state the problem here which again, somehow I'm moving multiple slides at once. <laughs> so, a classic statement of the problem evil from philosophical perspective. Three propositions, right? God is all powerful. God is completely good. Evil exists. Now you look at these three statements and this is supposed to be a contradiction. This is supposed to be disprove God, but there's no actual contradiction there, nor are our terms well defined. We don't, we know what evil exists means, but we haven't really defined it in such a way that it's contradictory to one of the first two statements. So let's start, give a quick definition of what evil is. Working definition, not super precise here, but I think it fits our intuition that we define something as evil when it causes human suffering. Uh, anything that causes a human being to suffer is potentially evil, that's what we're referring to here. In which case, there's two basic types of evil. There's moral evil, which is evil caused, or suffering caused by moral agents, that's beings capable of understanding morality. So that would be, at minimum, other human beings, but possibly other beings as well. And then there's natural evil, uh, things that don't appear to be caused by moral agents. Easy example, natural disaster. That would be what we'd call a natural evil. So if evil defined, let's look at perhaps the, the most famous example of a philosopher trying to draw out these hidden assumptions, right? Because I said there's no contradiction between those first three, even though we feel like there's, yeah, maybe there's something kind of there. We've got to add some additional propositions to try to draw out an actual conclusion. This is of J.L. Mackey. He adds the fourth proposition, a good thing always eliminates evil as far as possible. And the fifth, that there are no limits to what an all-powerful being can do. So for his critique to stand up, for his argument to stand up, both of his propositions have to be necessarily true. It's a philosophical term. That means not only has, is it true in our world, right, in our reality, but it has to be true in every possible reality. It, it, it's true by necessity. It, there can't be a world in which this statement is not true. Uh, just because something is true in the wor real world, our world, the actual world, doesn't necessarily mean that it is necessarily true. So for the theologian to defeat this argument, they would only have to assert that one of those two propositions is not necessarily true to provide sufficient reason to say it. Uh, I'll start with the fourth proposition. It, it's a bit easier, but I think actually both of them are not, not only not necessarily true, they're just simply false. So number four, a good thing always eliminates evil as far as possible. Obviously, we're talking about God here, right, for there to be a contradiction. So God always eliminates evil as far as is possible. I need to, as a theologian, I need to assert and prove, demonstrate, that there is a morally sufficient reason for God to choose not to eliminate evil, that it would be good for him not to eliminate all evil, then the proposition fails. Which leads us to the first defense. Uh, I'll start with a couple of what I call defenses of the problem of evil. These are things that defeat it intellectually, but they don't necessarily provide a, a satisfying answer. Right, so I'll get to the satisfying answers in the second half. The first half is more the intellectual response, and then the second half of the presentation is more a practical response. So the first defense is simply ignorance. 
in the book of Job, the reader knows, right? The reader knows what's going on. We're put in a, a position where we have knowledge that Job himself does not have. We know that uh, Job has been acting as a very righteous individual. The text actually calls him blameless. Uh, he has received a number of blessings from God as a result. And the Satan, the adversary, comes to God and says, yeah, you know that Job guy? He's only righteous. He only obeys you because of all the blessings you have given. You take those blessings away and he will no longer be righteous. You know, it's easy to be righteous if you have lots of blessings. But what about if he's suffering? Will he still be righteous? God says, go ahead, do your worst, basically. And, well, Job starts suffering greatly. All kinds of things are happening to him. People start coming to him, friends, supposedly, and giving them these explanations for what's going on. There must be some secret sin you haven't confessed. Uh, figure it out and, and make yourself right before God. In chapter 38, the climax of the book, God himself shows up on the scene and provides Job with an answer. Or does he provide Job with an answer? I'll read from verse 2. Who is this? This is God speaking. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? On what were its spaces sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. God goes on this way for quite some time. He does rebuke the friends, right? He, the so-called friends. He, he says they're wrong, right? You haven't done some secret sin. I'm not angry with you. I'm not punishing you. Something along those lines. But he never tells Job what the reader knows. He doesn't tell Job, oh, you know, this was just some, this was a test. Congratulations, you passed the test. You're truly righteous or something along those lines. He just says, I'm God. You're not. And that's the only explanation he offers. But it's the correct explanation for Job because he does come to realization of what, of his wrong thought, right? He comes to realization of his wrong thought, repents, so to speak, and is restored to his former state. In fact, he gets back twice of everything. So this is a good intellectual answer, right? If God is truly all-powerful and all-knowing, and we are finite and not all-knowing, it makes perfect sense that sometimes we would have no idea why some particular evil exists. But it's not very emotionally satisfying. So if we have good independent reasons to believe that Christianity is true, and I certainly think we do, obviously I'm not going into those today, but I certainly think that's the case, then it's no longer a problem for us, right? We, we say, okay, there are things about God, there's things about this world that I cannot understand. I accept that. Problem solved. Well, problem solved intellectually anyway. However, let's go a bit further because the Bible doesn't just leave us there and offer a second defense, the greater good defense, a very common defense against the problem of evil. And I'll use the story of Joseph as illustration. So in Genesis, we, we hear about how Joseph had a dream in which he, which once interpreted, people came to realize that he was going to rule over his brothers and even his parents. Obviously, his brothers are not super happy about this, so they sell him into slavery. Uh, he gets in a not too bad situation, but then he gets accused falsely of uh, sleeping with his master's wife, and he's thrown in jail. And through the circumstances, he eventually is elevated to a high position in Egypt. And because of the dreams that God is giving him, he has the nation prepare for a coming famine. Famine happens. Egypt has lots of stored grain. People are coming far and wide to uh, buy grain because they don't have anything to eat, including his brothers who show up on the scene. They quickly figure out that oh crap, Joseph's in charge here and we sold him into slavery. He's going to get revenge on us. But he says to them, do not fear for I'm in a place of God. For am I in uh, the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. 
In this story, right, we can clearly see, clearly see a greater good. Many people, Joseph's own family, but many others too, right, thousands of people were saved from this famine because of the suffering that Joseph endured. Now, this isn't always the case, though, right? Some evils, let's say murder, for example, can't possibly result in a greater good for the victim of that evil. So ultimately, a greater good defense is very similar to an ignorance defense in that you often have to say, I think that there's a greater good, but I don't know what that might be. That said, we can see that some things that we consider to be very good things do actually require suffering to exist. Things like courage or empathy or forgiveness. What would it mean to say I'm courageous if there's no possibility of harm in the situation? What would it mean to say I have empathy for you if you weren't suffering? What would it mean to say I forgive you if you couldn't sin? And, so, and, and love, which is self-sacrificial by nature, seems to require the existence of evil. How could I give up something of myself for someone else if everyone already had everything? So that's my second key takeaway here, is that some things that we consider good, very good, great, require the existence of evil to be meaningful. So let's return to the problem stated here. So we've defeated premise number four, right? We can see what, how, at least plausibly speaking, that uh, all-powerful God would have good reasons not to eliminate all evil. Now, it turns out that the fifth premise is also almost certainly false, in my opinion. When philosophers have thought about what it means to be all-powerful, nearly everyone has concluded that an all-powerful being can't create a logical contradiction, can't create a round square, for example. And thus, nearly all philosophers, regardless of whatever their perspective is, you know, Christian, atheist, some other religion, have concluded that the problem of evil is not actually a sound logical problem for the statement, for the existence of the Christian God. Instead, they'll restate the problem as a probabilistic problem. Here we go. Uh, we observe many great evils in the world. I think everyone would probably agree with that statement. We cannot think of a good re, re, of any good resulting from some of those evils. Again, easy to agree with. An all-powerful, all-good being would eliminate all evil that doesn't lead to a greater good. Again, probable. Therefore, it's unlikely that such a being exists given the amount and type of evil we exist, observe in the world. And I think that this is where most people would actually end up, right? And they may say that, you know, uh, if evil exists, God can't exist. But then if you actually press them on, they'd say, okay, my problem isn't really the mere existence of evil. My problem is there seems to be too much evil in this world. What we observe in the world doesn't seem compatible with an all-loving God. Maybe some evil's okay, right? But what I observe seems to be too much evil. And this is much more powerful of an argument from a practical perspective, but it's also highly subjective. I mean, what's too much, right? Uh, your too much might not match my too much. So intellectually, it's very difficult, but practically, it's very persuasive which leads us to addressing the problem from a more practical perspective. And I like to start with this idea, which is not usually included in these types of discussions, but I think it's a very good point to make, actually. And that's that the world we live in is not defined by evil. It is not primarily evil, but is in fact primarily good. When God makes creation, he looks at it and says, it was very good. Now, of course, the fall happens. Creation gets the order of creation gets put into disorder. Uh, the fall isn't Genesis 3, it's Genesis 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then Abraham is called in Genesis 11, which is the start of the restoration. But the rest of the Bible is the restoration. We still live in this fallen state. But creation by nature is good and remains primarily good. And we can see this in a number of ways. When we look at the world, we perceive things as beautiful. We might see some things as ugly, but when we look at most things in nature, uh, 
natural creation, we think they're beautiful. You know, we look at the stars, they're beautiful. We look at the forest, it's beautiful. We look at the ocean, it's beautiful, etc. Second, even the way we define the problem of evil shows us that the world is primarily good. We say, why do bad things happen to good people, right? No one says, why do good things happen to evil people? But if the world was primarily evil, then the good would be the exception that we need to explain. We need to explain the evil because it's the exception to the rule. Third, normal people, nearly all people, view staying alive as superior to dying. But by definition, in atheism, it should be neutral. There should be nothing inherently superior to being alive or being dead. And if you're suffering greatly, it should actually be preferable to end that suffering and to die, yet very few people would argue for that. And if someone does argue for that, we usually view them as being highly wrong on that point. Now, the atheists could say, or they could say, yes, we feel that way, but that's because we have an irrational, untrue belief that we derive from evolutionary forces that make us want to survive so that we can propagate our own DNA Ironic that they have to argue that evolution gives them false beliefs in order to argue that it gave them a true belief about God, but we'll leave that aside. Point being, normal people view this as a good principle that being alive is better than dying, which means being in this world is, being, is better than not existing. Fourth, we continue to have children. If, if the world is filled with evil, Bringing a child into this world would be an evil act. You would be bringing someone in to the world, knowing that they're going to suffer, knowing they're going to experience evil, and you would be arguably doing something morally wrong by bringing a child into this world. But it's not just the suffering of that child either. It's also the suffering of the parents, right? The parents will give up their resources. They'll give up money, time, effort in order to, to bring up this child. And that includes atheist parents, by the way. And they have the same belief in bringing up their children. But that doesn't make any sense if evil actually exists, if the world is not primarily good. Or, I mean, if evil doesn't exist or the world isn't primarily good. All right, so let's get to the first theodicy. A theodicy is an explanation for why you find evil in the world. And the first one, uh, Christians have classically offered primarily two, the first one being free will. So God could certainly create a world without any evil. He, he could create a world without any beings that are capable of making moral decisions. If you can't make a moral decision, you can't make any evil decisions. Of course, you can't make any good decisions either, but you can't make any morally evil decisions. And if a being is only capable of doing good, you know, doing good actions, does it really get any credit for it? A robot might be able to provide benefit to a human being, but can it be called morally good? I don't think it can. I think that moral good requires the ability to choose to do good. That means also the ability to choose not to do good. Thus, free will is necessary for moral good in this world. And God thus has a good reason to create the world with free will, because he wants a world with moral good in it. Now, the, the response will usually be agreement there, right? People won't usually deny that principle. But they'll say, yeah, but couldn't God create a world, all powerful being, I mean, he could do anything, right? He should be able to create a world in which all creatures always choose to do good. They have the ability to do evil, but they always choose to do good. Just in the interest of time, I won't go into the, the philosophical details of how this works out, but intuitively, it seems, and if you want to know the details, you can ask me later, but it, it, intuitively, it seems pretty obvious, right? If there's one being, maybe the physical world can be structured in such a way that they never choose to do evil. You had two, three, four, maybe it's still possible. But you add enough creatures, enough free creatures to the equation, their actions are influencing one another. They're not determining, right? You're not absolutely determining how someone else is going to act, but you are influencing them. You are be providing persuasion. 
And if we say that the, the outcome is, is the a combination of all the persuasive factors in the world that touch upon a person, then at some point it becomes impossible for every person to choose never to do evil. And in fact, in this world, we look at it and every person, every single person chooses to violate even their own standards, not even some absolute standard, but their own self-created standards, if that's what they have, they violate some of the time. So if no person in this world is capable of always choosing to do good, then what makes us think that a world where everyone did what no person in this world could do? And we have our Bible verse here of Romans chapter 3, in which uh, Paul writes, All, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, no one understands, no one seeks God. So free will probably provides an adequate explanation for moral evil. Uh, we have free will, we have the ability to do evil, we choose to do evil. But what about natural evil? Does a tornado choose to, to destroy a house? Of course it doesn't. However, even with natural evil, so-called natural evil, I think a lot of it is attributable to human sin. When a tornado hits the United States, maybe a dozen people die. When the exact same tornado hits Bangladesh, which happens to be the only other part of the world that, where tornadoes are common, several thousand people might die. In other words, global inequality has led to much of that suffering. Human sin has led to much of that natural suffering. Additionally, the, the Bible clearly teaches that demons can cause suffering. Demons are beings with moral agency. They have the ability to choose what they do. And thus, even natural evil is plausibly a moral evil in given circumstance. I'm not saying that every tornado is caused by a demon or something like that. There are other explanations for natural evil, which I'm not going to go into, just in interest of time. But again, you, you want to know about some of the other explanations which don't require a moral agent uh, and still produce a greater good, I'd be happy to do that. You can ask me in questions or after whatever. And thus, the intellectual problem, even the probabilistic problem, is solved. We, we have free will as a defense, a theodicy, an explanation. It seems to account for the majority of what we th think of as evil in the world. However, the Bible, again, goes further. Turns out that the Bible has quite a lot to say on suffering. I do a Bible study, and I use a lectionary, so I don't pick the readings. I'm not like purposely, you know, saying, oh, this, let's talk about this theme for the next four weeks or whatever. And yet, it seems like, I don't know, 20% of the time, the readings touch upon suffering in the world in some way, almost like Genesis 3 matters. Uh, that is, that's a very important part of the Christian understanding of the world. So time and time again, the Bible is talking about suffering. And Christians, throughout Christian history, starting right from the beginning, when they look at this question, right? It's not a new question. It's not something that has been invented in the 21st century. But when they look at this question of why evil exists, they offer the free will defense, and they offer the what is commonly called the soul-making theodicy. Irenaeus, for example, argued that we are created beings, and we're imperfect by nature. We're born as little babies. We're physically immature. Over time, we grow up, right? We become physically mature. Our bodies become more capable. He argues that the same is true spiritually. We're born spiritually immature. When we first convert to Christianity, we're spiritually immature. Over time, we learn. Well, how does the, how does the baby learn, right? How does the child learn? Well, one way they learn is through physical pain. Physical pain isn't always bad, right? You, you touch a hot stove, you feel pain, you learn something valuable as a result, and you don't do it again. Thus, when we sin, and it causes us pain, emotional pain, social pain, maybe physical pain, we learn as a result, and we're less inclined to do that sin. Sin leads to suffering because that suffering shows us to stop doing that sin. And in the Bible, in Hebrews, we read, The Lord disciplines the one who he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. We can view 
suffering as a form of discipline, as something to help us grow and mature. When a parent disciplines their child, it causes the child pain of some sort, right? It could be physical pain. It could be emotional pain. Uh, you know, you put them in time out, I guess it doesn't cause them physical pain, but it causes them pain, right? And they can't do what they want to do. It causes some kind of discomfort, but it's for the child's benefit. Likewise, suffering can be for our benefit. But don't hear me wrong. I'm not suggesting that all of your suffering, all anyone's suffering, is the result of their own sin. That would be quite wrong. Uh, and you do hear that sometimes in pseudo-Christian circles that, you know, you know, you're suffering because you don't have enough faith. And you need to have more faith and then you'll be cured of that disease you have or you'll be healed of that mental illness or whatever else, right? Uh, your, your child who has abandoned you will come home or, or whatever else, right? Uh, which I, I think is complete nonsense. It's completely contrary to what the Bible actually teaches. Someone says, uh, become a Christian and you'll have a perfect life. The Bible says, become a Christian and expect to suffer, expect to be persecuted, expect to be alienated from society, possibly from your own family. Thus, suffering is not always the result of one's own sins. In fact, it primarily is not. But the Bible says that all suffering produces benefit. James, the brother of Jesus, writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the Apostle Paul says something similar. He says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Two different authors, same idea, right? Adjust your attitude. Not easy to do, nearly impossible to do, I might add. I forgot to mention this at the start, but I feel the, the practical problem of evil very acutely. My wife is not here today because she suffers from a chronic pain condition uh, called CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome. In short, the, she slipped on ice, she had a physical injury, the physical injury healed, and the brain never fixed it. The brain still thinks that injury is there. So it sends constant pain signals warning you, right, that your foot, there's something wrong with your foot, when in fact there is nothing wrong with it. Uh, doctors don't really know exactly why this happens, but it's something that happens. I don't have a good explanation for it, right? It's something that happens. So I feel this very practically. It's very easy for me to stand here and say, oh, you know, Crystal, you should... That's my wife's name. You, you should just uh, rejoice in your suffering and, and, and so forth. When, we, when I get to the third theodicy, you'll see how I would actually respond to that. And, and suffering is really difficult, right? It's really difficult. But it's not like Paul, for example, doesn't understand that. Paul is an individual who suffered greatly. He was ostracized by his own people. Uh, he was rejected by members of the so-called church who, who were teaching that he was a false teacher, teaching a different gospel. He suffered even natural disaster. He was shipwrecked. Multiple attempts were made on his life. He was imprisoned. He suffered, 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 suffered. And ultimately, of course, he'll die as a martyr, although he doesn't necessarily know that when he is writing. And he, right, elsewhere, I'll get to it, the exact quote in a minute, but he says that this is temporary light affliction. So we can see that the Bible is telling us that there's something good about this suffering. What is that good, right? Well, whatever suffering we have, no matter how severe, it is time limited. You are going to die. You will, your pain will end. But what about that benefit, right, if you're a Christian? What, what about that, that benefit, that improved character, that, that greater understanding of who God is, that participation in his story? How long does that benefit last? That well, seems to be unlimited, right? We have eternal life with God without pain. So that, that 
in comparison, right, in this world, it may seem like the suffering is way, 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 way more substantial than any benefit. Oh, yeah, you know, I had to suffer with this incredible pain for 10 years, and uh, I came out with some endurance. Uh, yay, right? <laughs> but what if it's, you know, those 10 years compared to an eternity of relationship with God that you grew into as a result of that suffering. Now, suddenly, you can see why Paul says to rejoice in that suffering. And Jesus himself suffers as well, right? God becomes incarnate. He becomes one of us, and he suffers greatly. He's rejected by everyone, his closest friends included. He dies on the cross, crucifixion, the word excruciating in English comes from the word crucifixion because the Romans envisioned this punishment in order to say the worst possible thing that you could do to another human being is the worst possible thing they could imagine. So we get excruciating to describe the pain that you feel at a crucifixion. But it's not just that he suffered, right? Hebrews says something very Interesting, very strange, perhaps. Although he was a son, Jesus, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation. Think about that for a second. God is perfect, right? God takes on human form. He suffers. He learns, right? He's all-knowing. He learns obedience. He's perfect. He's made perfect. If you want a theological explanation of how this isn't a contradiction, I can do that later. But for purposes here, how powerful is that? That God himself learns obedience through suffering. That God himself is made perfect through suffering. That he becomes the source of eternal salvation because of the suffering. Without that suffering, there is no eternal salvation. The suffering has produced a great work, it seems. So just before we move on real quick, the, the full quote from Paul, for this light momentary affliction is preparing us for eternal weight of glory beyond our comparison as we look not to the things that are seen. And elsewhere, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. So the suffering has a very high purpose in the Christian worldview, right? To the Christian, it has a very high purpose. In other words, it only makes sense within the context of the Christian worldview. Finally, I'd like to offer a third theodicy, which is not something is not commonly found in literature. I invented the term for the glory of God theodicy. I personally think, however, that, so, right, it's coming just from me, not, not like from lots of great thinkers, so take it with a grain of salt, but I personally think that this, this verse here from John is actually the key verse to understanding suffering in the world. As Jesus is traveling around, he encounters a man who is born blind. You know, he's been blind his entire life, which in that time, in that place, meant that he had no ability to work a productive life. The only way he could get through life is by the generosity of others. Uh, own family, if possible. In this case, his, maybe he didn't have family, or maybe they just abandoned him. It happens. And either way, all he could do is sit on a street corner every day, beg for money so they could survive. And the disciples see this man, and they think they're being very clever. They say to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And this reflects the common beliefs at the time, that everyone's sin, right? You, you, everyone's suffering. You look at that person, they're suffering. You look at that person, they're suffering. There's some reason for it, some sin. Maybe it was their parents' sin. Maybe it's their own sin. Maybe it's some other ancestor's sin. But it's something personal. God is punishing this person because of someone's sin. And Jesus says, oh yeah, you're right. It, it was because his parents were really evil. No, 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 he doesn't do that. He denies that the, blind, the punishment is 
any, or that the blindness is any kind of punishment at all, it says, it is not that this man sinned or that his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus, of course, then heals him, which shows the glory of God, shows the compassion of God, testifies to who Jesus is, builds the case for Jesus being God incarnate, the Messiah who will die on the cross. I will suggest, right, in context, obviously this is about Jesus. It's about Jesus being glorified through the healing miracle. Jesus says this man is has this physical defect because it will allow me to demonstrate who I am. But let me suggest the same is true for us as well. Suffering in this world allows us to glorify God by helping those who suffer. Jesus says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What does it mean to love one another? It means a lot of things. But the primary way that we think about it, right, that person is being loving when they're caring for someone else, when they're providing for someone else, when they're doing things for someone else. And what better opportunity to witness to someone, to not by like going in and preaching to them, oh, you're a sinner, that's why you are suffering, but just being there with them, being there for them in their time of need. When I hear about people who convert to Mormonism, for example, it's almost always, I was having this difficult situation, and some Mormons came to me, and they were very nice to me. And they say, well, they got all kinds of theological problems. I don't care. They were nice to me, right? Uh, they did things for me when no one else would do anything for me. I'm joining the Mormon church. And that's pretty sad testimony to us as a body of Christians. Mormons, who are not Christians, are being better Christians than we are in their relationship to the world. But it's not just in helping others that we can glorify God through suffering. It's also in our own suffering that allows us to glorify God. We can attract people to God by the way that we deal with suffering. In 2 Corinthians, we, we read, we, Paul and other apostles, are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of the body, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And just real quick, the other quote here, and then I'll, I'll talk about the two of them. In uh, 2 Corinthians, also in 2 Corinthians, later in the book, we read about Paul having this thorn in his side, as he calls it, which he prays for God to remove three times. The text is ambiguous. I think that's intentional so that we can all see our own suffering in whatever Paul is dealing with. God does not remove it. He provides the answer. My grace is sufficient for you, so that, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Take these two thoughts together, right? In our suffering, we carry the death of Jesus with us. In our suffering, in our weakness, we're made perfect. God wants to use those who are imperfect, who are weak, who are pathetic by world standards, so that they get the credit? No, so that they couldn't possibly get the credit, and he gets all the glory. Our suffering, we carry the death of Jesus. His death takes away our sins, right? Through our suffering, we're participating in the crucifixion so that we may participate in the resurrection as well and receive Christ's imputed righteousness as a result. So my last key point here, and then I'll, I'll summarize briefly, is that just as there are many causes of suffering in the world, we should expect multiple explanations for it. There's lots of reasons people suffer. We shouldn't expect a uniform reason for every situation. So in any specific event, ignorance is a good explanation. I don't know, right? I don't know why my wife suffers so much. However, we can see that there's a good principle of greater good because many things we require good 
Many things we call good require suffering to exist. In general, free will does provide an adequate intellectual answer for evil and a pretty good, a pretty good practical answer as well. You know, you are suffering because someone has wronged you. It's a very satisfying answer to people quite often. Suffering allows us to grow as people, leading to eternal benefit. And evil and suffering gives us the opportunity to show God's love in our lives and to others. The Christian should expect, expect to face suffering, and their call is two things. One, adjust your perspective. Look at Jesus. He suffered greatly. You should expect to suffer as well. When we handle pain in a way that honors God, we are living a Christian story, and we are participating. We're not just doing something we're commanded, but we're participating in his story. We are up there on the cross with him. And ultimately, suffering is temporary compared to eternity, which helps us to adjust our perspective. Christians are called to fight evil in the world. We're called to do something about the problem of evil. We're not called to just sit there and point fingers or, or say, woe is me. Uh, I, my situation is so bad. I, I'm so unlucky but we're called to fight against evil in the world. We're called to produce good in the world, in other words. And when someone is suffering, this is the best time to demonstrate God's love through them, God's love for them through your own actions. And that doesn't mean I go and I lay hands on someone and I cure them of their illness. If that happens, great. But just being there for someone is actually the primary way that you help someone who is suffering my wife obviously complains about her suffering often, right? And, and sometimes I try to talk to her and give her guidance and she's like, just shut up and hold me, right? <laughs> I don't need your explanations. I want your presence. And that helps a lot. So just be there for someone who is suffering and you can demonstrate God's love in their life. All right, so we'll take questions now. No, no questions? I thought you meant five minutes till questions. <laughs> All right, no questions. You'll have to ask me privately. <laughs> you one. one question, Cal says. Thank you so much for your presentation. So alongside with the problem of suffering and evil, mm -hmm. a lot of people object to the concept of hell. Mm -hmm. um, how would you, for a skeptic or non-believer, how would you kind of help them understand this concept? Or what's your personal view of hell? Yeah, okay. So I'll try to answer that as briefly as possible. You can ask me for more details. Uh, but briefly, Christians have held a variety of opinions on the doctrine of hell over the years. We, we call it the classical definition of a, eternal conscious torment. But when you look at Christian history, that's not really true. Christians have had different ideas about it. Um, there's not a lot of justification in the Bible for this idea of universalism that everyone eventually goes to heaven. I think that's unbiblical. But I think that there's good biblical support for the idea that you just simply cease to, ex you might experience a period of punishment, right? But at some point, you simply cease to exist. There is no life apart from God. You're separated from God. Uh, you simply cease to exist. But whether you're talking about a annihilationist view, that's called annihilationism, or a traditional view, which shouldn't really be called traditional, I think that there are good ways to explain it, right? So go with the eternal conscious torment, which is supposed to be the hardest view, right? The, the one that people can't uh, defend. Well, that person has been thrown into hell, right? They've committed a finite number of sins, certainly. Uh, everyone would agree with that. You have a finite lifetime, you can't commit an infinite number of sins. So how is an infinite punishment justified? Well, the person continues to rebel against God, right? They, they have separated themselves from God, and they're feeling the effects of being separated from God. They're not being punished per se, right? It's not that God is actively torturing this person because they deserve it or something. They've chosen to be separated from God. They're no longer feeling the good of God that they were feeling while being alive without realizing it or, or, or while rejecting it. And because they've made that choice, 
then it's justified that they will reject God. And now they're suffering, right? Now they're suffering. And they continue. now they're angry. They're, they're continuing to reject God on a daily basis. They no longer can claim you don't exist, but they can continue to say, how dare you, God? How dare you do this to me? And thus they continue to sin. So that would be my short answer. Uh, I don't have a strong personal opinion, but I do lean towards annihilationism. All right, I think I'm not supposed to take another question. Al disappeared, but. <laughs> Go ahead. Did your wife's situation with the pain in her foot kind of help bring your study together? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this in the past, but uh, the disease is progressive, uh, it gets worse over time. And I, I think probably the first time that I spoke about the problem of evil, it had like either just begun or it hadn't begun. Uh, obviously, people suffer, right? So it's not like it was uh, unfamiliar with the idea of suffering. But certainly it has adjusted my perspective and, and helped me think about these issues over time. 